Greetings, AP US History Kids. I know I'm fulfilling your wish by letting you see Scruggs at home over the weekend, too. But since this is your first flip video recording for the semester to introduce the progressive era, I need you to do a couple of things. We need to unplug. That means put this away. All right, I don't need texting, no tweeting, mess around on Facebook, Instagram, any of that stuff. The MySpace, to use something from when I was starting teaching. And unplug all that. Don't be watching TV on the side or have Pandora open also. Focus on this video for a few minutes. All right, with the progressive era, you're going to see some names come up that we've already seen. Some guys like W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Women's li women like Jane Addams and her Hull House experiment. But you can see there that I've got that this is a reform movement that starts in the late 1800s and carries into the 1900s. And some people say it goes up as late as the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. Um, but this is a effort to make society better. You know, the key word, progressive, progress. Right, people are trying to progress society into the next state. And I've got there that some people saw the government as an agency of human welfare. It means the government, in some people's eyes, need to do more to look out for its citizens. I've got there, this was a huge departure from Jeffersonian America. Remember, Thomas Jefferson said we should be a small country, at least with a small central government. Not necessarily small land size, but have a small central government and let people fend for themselves and let the states make decisions. Well, the progressive era is a push towards larger federal power. All right, I've got here that a lot of people believe that life was too complex now for the federal government to not get involved and help people. All right, so this really goes back to state level reforms into the 1880s. There's a wave of socialist immigrants coming from Europe. A lot of people are starting to call for economic and social injustice um, corrections in America. And we've also got a lot of journalists that we're going to call muckrakers, term Teddy Roosevelt coined, and they're going to write about what needs to change in society. They're going to dredge up all this muck. All right, so we've got some of the goals here. They Folks want to limit the power of trusts and monopolies, which we've already talked about how steps were taken towards that through the um, Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, but unfortunately that act was originally used to break up labor unions, completely opposite to its purpose. I got here we want to improve working and living conditions for working America. That means the working classes. That means we just wanted a higher standard of living in America. Consumer protection was a key thing so that you didn't eat rancid meat or things like that or eat cookies that had been licked by a dog and dropped on the floor and things like that. And then also um, conservation was a part of this. Conservation is a, a big push to try to save our natural resources in the West. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about here is how people want to regulate corporations. Teddy Roosevelt gets the nickname of the trust buster as president. And the big reason for that is because um, Roosevelt starts using the Sherman Act and trying to actually put some teeth into the law to try to break up corporations. So I've got there that he attacked the Northern Securities Company, which was a holding company owned by J.P. Morgan and James Hill that controlled railroads in the Northwest. But we'll see that Roosevelt, even though he gets the trust buster, buster name, didn't break up nearly as many trusts as his successor, William Howard Taft. All right, progressivism really goes back to the populist movement. I've got there that um, this... Um, push for government reform goes back to the call for greenbacks and more coinage or free silver, things that farmers wanted, the working classes wanted. And way back to the Gila days, we talked about people upset with government corruption, government inefficiency, and social injustices. So really, a lot of people see the progressive movement as not something new, but the continuation of a trend that already started. All right, some of the early writers we're going to talk about. The first one you need to recognize is Henry Damaris Lloyd, who wrote a book called Wealth Against Commonwealth. Um, I'm going to have to refer to my notes here. Henry Damaris Lloyd is a big fan of um, Henry Ward Beecher, who was an abolitionist preacher. He's got had a Columbia Law degree, just like your esteemed president. Um, and he's also a guy that attacked Standard Oil. You know, when we talked about the Gilded Age, we talked about Ida Tarbell writing about the Standard Oil Company. Well, Henry Lloyd attacked the Standard Oil Monopoly well before Ida Tarbell. The next one there, Thorstein Veblen wrote in the theory of the leisure class about how basically history is always divided into two classes and the leisure class would be the wealthy in society. And he wrote about how this was an era of conspicuous consumption. I apologize, y'all are going to have to ignore that phone behind me for a second. Um, but conspicuous consumption is going to refer to um, people basically living beyond their means. It's going to refer to an era when many Americans couldn't keep up with the wealthier Americans. There's this big gap between the working classes and the wealthier classes. And then our last guy here, Jacob Reese, was a guy that wrote How the Other Half Lives. How the Other Half Lives was about um, the other half of society, the half that wasn't wealthy. He would go around to the slums on the Lower East Side of New York City, these dumbbell tenement buildings, and take pictures and 
um, report on how things were. And he actually, when Roosevelt became police commissioner in New York, he would travel the streets with Jacob Reese because Jacob Reese knew where the slums were, knew where the robbers hung out and things like that. And he knew where the police weren't doing their job that Roosevelt tried to clean up. So we'll see um, more of how the other half lives. All right, this is also when the social gospel movement is in full effect and Jane Addams and Hull House, um, which we've already brought up, were starting to change lives for women. And the social um, gospel movement, the Selma Houses, were really a lot of times middle class women trying to push for change. And here's Jane Addams' 20 years of Hull House writings about um, her experiences there. This will be one of the possible book review projects some of y'all have later in the semester. All right, and then I mentioned that Teddy Roosevelt coins the term muckrakers. A lot of the muckrakers were writers for magazines, magazines like McClure's Magazine, founded by Sam McClure, who was a very eccentric person. And we'll see that he actually created this huge community of writers that were trying to expose all the corruption and ills in society. And then he eventually drove those writers off with his own eccentricities. Eccentricities, I'm not sure if I said that right. And McClure actually ended up getting tangled in an affair of his own that a lot of his writers thought um, brought down his magazine. So we'll be coming back to McClure several times. And a lot of the writers that left him, like William Allen White you see here, Lincoln Stevens, they ended up founding a new magazine called The American Magazine where they tried to continue their muckraking work. All right, the first of the muckrakers we're going to discuss though is going to be Lincoln Stevens. Lincoln Stevens, a book called The Shame of the Cities, another one of those options for our um, progressive book project. And this was about corruption in municipal government, corruption in cities, um, he wasn't really focused on Tammany Hall. You know, we've already talked about Boss Tweed and the Tweed Ring being brought down for the most part by um, Thomas Nast. Um, Stevens was focusing more on Midwestern cities. We've discussed Ida Tarbell. You looked at that SAS interactivity on how she brought down Standard Oil, um, which remember I said that Henry Lloyd was writing about Standard Oil well before Ida Tarbell. And Tarbell was actually the peacemaker of McClure's magazine. Whenever um, S.S. McClure, Sam McClure were dealing with everyone else's nerves, Ida Tarbell would break up the arguments in the office. All right, Ray Standard Baker is another of the muckrakers who befriended President Roosevelt for a while. Several of these muckrakers befriended Roosevelt. Um, he went to Michigan State University. Uh, I've got my notes that he was a guy that was influenced by the Pullman strike when he saw that in Chicago. Um, he was a big supporter of Woodrow Wilson in the election of 1912, I mean, so he had a little bit of a split with Roosevelt there, which we'll see in a later PowerPoint for the Progressive Era and wrote about um, labor issues, labor versus management for most of his career. The next guy, William White, he was a guy who really flipped his views. Remember I, when I talked about the Wizard of Oz, we talked about how William Allard White wrote an article about how the Kansas farmers were stupid. That's how we um, brought in the scarecrow into the Wizard of Oz analogy there. Well, William Allen White by this time has kind of become the spokesman for middle America. So at once he was um, used by the Republicans to talk basically bad about um, William James Bryan, say the populists were crazy. Now he's kind of come around to that populist point of view. Um, I've got that he was angered by the Ku Klux Klan. He actually tried to um, drive them out of Kansas. He eventually purchased the Emporia Gazette where he did a lot of his writing. Um, he was a guy who was a muckraker in um, the Midwest in Kansas that would travel from New York at time to time, work with McClure's Magazine at times, and Eventually, um, like I said, he ended up being a close friend of Roosevelt. Even through the election of 1912, he ended up being a close confidant of President Roosevelt. All right. Our next muckraker is a guy who wrote novels named Frank Norris, wrote The Octopus. You can see this thick tome here. The Octopus was a fictional novel. It's about um, railroad corruption in California and how the railroads were uh, basically taking advantage of the little guy. All right, John Spargo is the guy who was born in England. He was socialist leaning. He wrote a book called The Bitter Cry of the Children about the way basically children were treated um, almost like wage slaves in some factories. And he brought forward the idea that he thought that the state should take upon itself the responsibility to feed impoverished children because he thought it's pointless to send kids to school to try to learn if their stomachs are empty, that nothing's going to get done. All right, then also around this time, um, you've already read about the jungle in chapter 28, hopefully, and you know that this was Upton Sinclair's book where he was exposing the ills of the meatpacking industry, which was, if we hadn't had the ACT registration today, going to be my segue um, after the cookie activity we did. Um, but anyways, Dr. Harvey Wiley becomes the head of the Food and Drug Administration that helped Roosevelt helps to create. He's a chief chemist, and he basically created a poison squad that would go and try to root out some of these um, tainted foods and medicines. All right. 
for the progressive era, there's also a big push to change city government. All right, you've already done the SAS activity, hopefully, about initiative, referendum, and recall. So you should know that initiative was the push for people to be able to um, start the vote on a bill. Referendum is when the people can vote on a bill, and recall is when people could call, recall a bad official from public office. Um, I've got here that some people started to adopt the idea of the secret or Australian ballot, since that was where it was tried first. So rather than you say, here's the Democrat ballot, I'm going to drop that in the ballot box, or here's the Republican ballot, I'm going to drop that in the ballot box, now you actually vote in secret, so your neighbors don't know who you're voting for. Um, a lot of folks around this time started to push for direct election of senators, which we know came with the 17th Amendment. And then this is when our women's rights movement, which has been ongoing ever since the Seneca Falls Convention, is coming to fruition. All right, um, some cities started to adopt a new form of government. They started to adopt the council manager system. And this is first um, experiment with in Galveston, Texas, after the city was destroyed by a hurricane in 1900. Um, the new Galveston um, city manager system relied on an elected town council that would then hire a city manager to run things. You can see here, I felt God, that people also started to deal with Slum lords um, tried to change the process for dealing with juvenile delinquents and prostitution. You know, the world's oldest profession was still a problem at the time. Um, so a lot of cities tried to do what they could to root out prostitution. All right, progressive reform at the state level came through really three main governors. Um, one of the most prominent is going to be Bob LaFollette from Wisconsin. This guy right here, you're going to need to recognize him. Um, he was eventually a senator. Um, he pro promoted a lot of things in Wisconsin. He promoted a progressive income tax. He promoted a uh, minimum wage for workers, workman's comp um, legislation so that people could actually get paid if they were injured on the job. Um, he also favored direct election senators and an open primary. And we'll see that he eventually ran for president down the road. Um, Charles Evans Hughes, who eventually became a Supreme Court Justice, was a New York governor um, who worked to try to um, have more government regulation of businesses and bring about an eight-hour workday in New York. And then this guy right here has been in the news a lot in North Carolina, Charles B. Acock. There's a dorm named after him at UNC. There's a dorm named after him at um, East Carolina, which people have tried to get his name taken off of those dorms because for a while he was one of the biggest white supremacists in the state. But he's also known as the education governor. And he actually did a lot to increase educational opportunities for black children. But at the same time, he was, um, for most of his political career, determined to keep uh, black citizens in a subordinate role. So he's um, a man that's really at both ends of the spe uh, spectrum with his progressivism. All right, I'm going to finish here before I get into the presidents next week, talking about two court cases. The first one, Lochner versus New York, was a case that came before the Supreme Court challenging a New York law that limited Baker's hours. Said the Bakers can only work 10 hours per day and no more than 60 per week. Um, the Supreme Court rejected this law by a 5-4 vote by saying that the 14th Amendment gave uh, businesses due process. All right, so this really starts what we call the Lochner era, where the Supreme Court begins a series of invalidating state regulation um, of working laws. All right, a case that follows this three years later is called Mueller versus Oregon. And in Mueller versus Oregon, um, the case was really saying, are men and women equal in the workplace? And the Supreme Court said no. This was referring to a law that um, regulated uh, women's working hours in Oregon. And basically what happened was the Supreme Court decided that women's physical structures being weaker made them not able to work as long as men. So. Um, this law was basically upheld saying that women could have more restrictions on their working hours than men. All right, and we're going to start class on Monday looking at a video about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. We'll see this was a fire in a um, basically sewing factory in New York where you had girls having to jump eight stories to their death or get burned in flames because all of the fire escapes at their um, factory were locked. And we'll see that this call for, led to the call for a lot of change among the um, workplace safety laws. All right, as you can see, we're going to get into three progressive presidents, Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, and they were each progressive in different ways, and that's what we'll start with next week. Remember, you need to fill out a Google form about this video, and like I said, the progressive era really in a lot of people's eyes goes all the way up through um, President Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I hope to see y'all with no black eyes or bruises this weekend, as I, after this weekend as I go through a handball tournament, but make sure, like I said, that you fill out the Google form associated with this. You've got all that homework done before I see you again. I'll see you next week.